I need some traction. Before we get started, let's give a shout out to our podcast sponsor for today. Duplo Cloud is a one-stop shop solution for all your DevOps, cloud automation, and compliance needs from infrastructure provisioning and application deployment to security controls, compliance certification, and alerts. Visit duplocloud.com. That's D-U-P-L-O-C-L-O-U-D.com. Get two months free by contacting info at duplocloud.com. Thank you everyone for listening in, tuning in today. Super excited for this session. As we all know, the list of go-to-market tools for buyers to pick from seems to be never ending. Fortune 500 CIOs and startup revenue leaders alike are inundated by tools and overwhelmed by the complexity of the buying process. So excited to have Demi here today, Vice President at Sapphire Ventures. Sapphire has backed 16 companies on the Forbes Cloud 100 list, making Sapphire our top five investor in the B2B SaaS category. Demi focuses on growth stage investments in horizontal and vertical SaaS applications with a fantastic portfolio of high growth companies, including Yellow.ai, Six Sense, Captivate IQ, Flowcast, Gem, Paradox, and Qualified. For more than a decade, Sapphire has invested in numerous technology companies that have now become core to the B2B GTM motion. So Demi and his team have observed the top trends impacting the industry as well as products that are cutting edge of the B2B GTM tech stack. And today he is going to break it down for us. He is going to tell us what we should have in our go-to-market tool stack to drive double, triple, quadruple digit growth. Demi, welcome to Traction. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks Lloyd. Great to be here. Really excited to chat with you and, and also you know, just share some thoughts and learnings with the Traction audience. Fantastic, Demi. So. Give us your backstory first. How did you get into investing? Absolutely. You know, I I grew up in Nigeria, um, so I, I you know I, I lived there for several years, and also um, you know lived in Canada for a few years before coming to the U.S. for college. And in college, I studied mechanical engineering, but I was always interested in the business world. I you know really I had this longstanding passion for investing since I was a kid. And, um, you know, when I got to college, you know, I tried to pursue both of these things. I, I joined this stock market investment team that we had on campus. And then I also started a company with a friend of mine. And I think it was really the combination of those two experiences that led me to venture capital, because, you know, as a result of that bit of an investing experience that I had, you know, I, I felt like I had some background in investing, I knew a little bit about investing. And then also through the process of starting that company with my friend, I knew the challenges of students looking to you know, raise capital for their startups. And so in my senior year of college, I partnered with a few friends of mine. You know, we started a dumb room fund called A-Level Capital that is still operational to this day. And then, you know, after college, I worked in investment banking at Goldman Sachs for a few years. And this is really the turning point for me because it was through the Goldman Alumni Network that I met a venture capitalist and he was working at a venture firm in New York. Um, and he was a great mentor to me just during the course of my time in investment banking. And eventually there was an opportunity to actually join the firm that he worked at uh, called First Mark Capital. And you know, fortunately things worked out. I spent a few years working at First Mark Capital with the team there as a generalist, where I was investing in everything from consumer healthcare to developer tools. Um, during that time, I started to have a desire to move to the Bay Area because you know, this was back in like 2017 to 2019. Um, the world was not nearly as distributed as it was as it is right now. It was actually very concentrated. Um, in the Bay Area. And so, you know, I wanted to move over here and really, you know, be at the epicenter of the industry. And that led me to a boutique fund in the Bay Area where I started to focus a bit more. You know, initially I was generalist at First Mark, but then I started to focus primarily on B2B SaaS when I first moved here to the Bay. And then I joined Sapphire where I continued to focus on B2B SaaS companies. Um, the only difference now at Sapphire is that I now exclusively focus on growth stage investing, whereas, you know, up to this point in my career, I being primarily an early stage investor. Um, so that's that's the short version of just how I got into venture capital, you know, and how I, how I got to Sapphire. Definitely great, great story there with Origins starting a company. So perfect segue, tell us more about Sapphire went Ventures. What stage of companies you guys invest in? What is an ideal, I guess, investee profile for you? Type of company? A revenue profile, growth rate, give us the skinny. 
Absolutely. You know, at Sapphire, we are we're growth stage investors. You know, we focus on uh, B2B SaaS companies in four main categories. Um, so that's applications, which is basically a general name for things like sales and marketing software, HR software, customer support software, and so on. We also invest in infrastructure and cybersecurity. So that's where you know you can think of developer tools, open source companies, uh, data machine learning infrastructure, and so on. And then we invest in fintech and crypto companies as well. At this point, we're investing globally. We have portfolio companies in North America, in Europe, in Israel, in India, and Australia. And you know our mission, what drives us at Sapphire, is really to invest in what we call companies of consequence. If you go to our website, sapphireventures.com, you know it's right there, front and center. And you know our focus on this class of companies came from the insight that, as a venture capital investor, there are many ways for you to generate a return, but the very best companies not only generate the financial return, but they also have a strong halo effect on everyone associated with those companies. You know, I'm talking about companies like LinkedIn, like Square, like DocuSign, like Fox, and many others that Sapphire has been you know, fortunate to be a part of. And all of these companies, they started off with a handful of employees and then ended up becoming household names. So that's what we're, you know, that's our mission. That's what we're, we're out there day in, day out uh, looking for. You know, in terms of just you know, the, some of the parameters of the companies we look for, I'd say it really varies, right? You know, at Sapphire, we, you know, we bid on companies that are, you know, a few million in revenue, like sub 5 million in revenue. And at the same time, we've, um, you know, bid on companies that are, you know, 40 plus million in, in revenue as well. So there's a bit of a range, you know, we, we're investing with $2 billion fund. And so that allows us to be a bit flexible um, at the, in the stage that we invest at. Fantastic. So for all our listeners, if you're hitting that criteria, contact, Demi here, he's a great person. I've known him for a while now and overall fantastic investor to talk to from a making connections standpoint to sharing advice, uh, overall badass. So let's, let's bring some of that badassness into the GTM stack. You know, lots of tools, we're all inundated. We don't know what yeah. to pick. Everyone's using something else. What are the key elements of a great GTM stack? Like, you know, give us the ideal motion, driving demand, learnings and pitfalls from your portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's, it's exactly right, right? You need to think about the entire go-to-market team and, and how it fits together. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the concept of product market fit, right? Like finding, uh, designing or creating the right product that addresses the problem that the market is, is facing. Um, but then it's not enough to just have product market fit um, because the product is you know, typically not going to sell itself, right? So you actually need to have a go-to-market team out there, you know, getting and taking that product um, into the market and converting uh, customers. And, you know, that kind of gave rise to this concept of go-to-market fit because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to sell a dollar for 90 cents, right? You want to actually create a, a business that you can, you know, put in, you can invest in that business and get more out of it um, than what you put in. So, you know, the concept of go-to-market fit is really about designing a go-to-market motion that is efficient and that generates more ARR than the amount you spend on sales and marketing. And, you know, in, look, in studying this over the years, you know, I really like a framework that was created by Bob Tinker, who was the former co-founder and CEO of Mobile Iron, as well as Tegi Nam, uh, who's an investor at a fund called Storm Ventures. And, you know, this, the, the framework that they put together, it starts with nailing the customer journey right? And then you have to create a repeatable go-to-market playbook. Um, you have to iterate on that playbook because you're never going to get it right the first time. And even if you do, the market environment is constantly changing. And then finally, you need to identify and measure the key metrics of success. And I'm, I'm going to take those one by one, right? So starting with nailing the customer journey, you know, that, that really begins with figuring out what's the urgent pain that your customers have. You know, why should they buy from a seed stage company um, when they could go with kind of larger, more experienced vendors. And now where should they do that now? Because you need to have that urgency um, in, in the customers in order for them to you know, purchase from you. So you, once you figure that out, you want to design your ideal customer journey. And you know, the precise steps will vary depending on whether this is an inbound go-to-market model, an outbound go-to-market model, or product-led mo model. Um, you know, for an inbound company, the journey might start with like, attracting visitors to your website, converting those visitors to leads, you know, closing those leads, renewing them and expanding them. Um, if you're a product like company, that journey might look different because you want to get visitors to your website, but they actually want them to get, start using the product as soon as possible and then convert them to signups and then paying customers. 
So once you figure out the pain, you want to figure out what the right, what's the right journey, right, that the customer should go through in, in order to adopt your product successfully um, and also in, 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 for them to get value out of the product at the end of the day, because customers have a choice. If they start using your product and it's not great, then they can turn off and go on to, you know, something else. And this, you know, feeds into the next step, right, which is creating your repeatable go-to-market playbook, because you figured out the pain, you know what the customer journey is like. Now you need to map your team, you need to map your activities, you know, to each stage in that customer journey. Um, and then, you know, the way, the way we typically approach this is, you know, you have that journey. So let's say if we take that inbound model, um, the initial stage of that journey is attracting visitors to your website. You want to figure out who's going to own that stage of the journey. Um, you know, who, what are they, what's, what's that team or that individual going to do at that particular stage? And then you want to figure out what are the exit criteria for moving from attractive visitors to the website to conversion to leads. So let's just say, you know, for attractive visitors to the website, your marketing team, you know, could be responsible for that stage, right? So that goes into your um, go-to-market playbook that you're creating. And then what does the marketing team do? They might choose to create awareness through, you know, channels like blogs or, or podcasts or videos or social media and so on. And so they're going to detail exactly how they're going to attract your um, your visitors to the website. And then finally, you know, they're going to determine what's the exit criteria. Like what does a visitor to the website have to do to move on from just being an anonymous visitor on the website to being a lead that the sales team can then, you know, go after. And, you know, that could involve things like, okay, when a visitor comes to the website, if they fill out the form, you know, then they're qualified lead. If they sign up for a webinar, you know, then they get a certain number of points as well. If they uh, chat with, you know, our chat bot, if they, if they request a demo, there could be various things, right, that you put into that particular criteria to exit from being uh, just an anonymous visitor on the website to being a lead that your sales team should then spend some more time with. So, and then finally, you know, these things, in order to be successful at these, um, at these activities, you need certain tools. So for marketing, that might mean they need a conversational sales and marketing tool, like a chat bot to put on the website to engage with leads. Uh, it could mean that they need a content management system, right, in order to manage the blogs uh, that you have on your website. It, it could mean they need a social media tool to, in order to manage the engagement, the posting across different social channels. So you essentially will map all these things um, to your go-to-market, your customer journey. And that way, you know exactly who's responsible for which stage, exactly what they're doing at each stage. You, you know the goal of that stage, which again, maybe to like fill out a form or sign up for a webinar. And then you know the tools that you need to be successful at that stage. So that becomes your playbook, right? It becomes how are we going to move um, a, a, a random visitor to a website across our customer journey to being a successful customer. And then you know, once you create the playbook, I, like I mentioned earlier, you're never going to get it right the first time. And even if you somehow lock into it, um, you know, the market environment changes, right? Like 2021 is very different from 2022 or a new um, competitor might enter into the market and that changes the dynamic of things. That changes how you want to run your playbook. So you're constantly putting the playbook into practice and iterating on it um, to, until you work out the kinks and you can see the changes in your efficiency. And then finally, you want to measure your key metrics of su success. And I think go-to-market is probably notorious for having too many metrics. There's so many metrics you, you can track from the top of the funnel all the way through to the bottom of the funnel. But, you know, I think the most important things, what all of those KPIs are tracking ultimately work towards is just the efficiency of the go-to-market motion. Um, in other words, how much ARR is the company generating for every dollar invested in sales and marketing? Um, and then finally, the retention, because it's no, it's no good to acquire all these customers, but then they only, they end up churning or they end up, they end up spending less with you over time. So retention is really critical to track like your logo retention, your revenue retention, and your net dollar retention. So those I would say are just the key, you know, those, those are the beginnings of a great go-to-market motion is uh, figuring out that repeatable playbook and then, you know, measuring, constantly measuring and iterating on the playbook so that you ensure, you know, the efficiency of the business. So when you see companies at the early stages getting to the GTM or go to market fit, what are some key traits they exhibit? What are some things they do to get that repeatable playbook you've seen become successful? Yeah, I think some of the things they do, it really, it really is, it really comes down to the iteration, right? I think, you know, when a founder starts a company, they have a, they have an initial thesis, right? They have an initial idea on what exactly it is that, you know, their prospects or their customers want. And then they go up and they do a lot of, you know, customer development work. They interview a lot of uh, potential users to figure out, you know, what's the right initial product for them to build. 
Um, and then, you know, they might, they might test that, right, with a few customers. Usually the first few customers, you know, might be, you know, friends or friends of friends, you know, kind of very close um, contacts. But then, you know, when you need to sell a cold lead, right, someone who you don't know before, you don't have any particular relationship with before, you know, then you need to start figuring out what is a repeatable playbook for me to convert people who've never heard about my business, you know, get them through the sales process and help them be a successful customer. This is also the point where, you're probably hiring, you know, your first, you know, one or two AEs and, you know, those AEs need to be, they need to be very flexible, right? They need to be able to operate in an environment where there's not an existing playbook that they can take and run, but they're able to iterate quickly to the right answer at each stage of the customer journey and then help to build that playbook that um, other, that you can then scale, you know, based off of. And so, you know, when we're looking at, when we're looking at companies, right, we want to make sure that they're able to make that transition from founder-led sales you know, to having maybe a few AEs who found success to ultimately being able to hire, you know, classes of AEs every couple of quarters and seeing those AEs also find success um, in, um, in the market. Certainly, certainly. Uh, great advice there. Everything starts with the founder figuring out the ideal customer profile, doing things that don't scale, trying to get maybe five, 10 people to pay to try it out. And then once you've figured out that playbook, then you start adding people because it's tough to add salespeople when you yourself haven't sold it because they got to figure out the messaging. They got to, if your product is not a product exactly. market fit, there's no high retention, people churn out. And it's hard to teach somebody to sell your product when you know it's not crystallized. Customers are not using it, loving it, trying yeah, it, and buying even, it. You know, the first, the first one or two salespeople, they'll, you know, they'll have certain characteristics of founders too because there's no there's no playbook just yet the founder has sold 10 deals but then you know it was their 10 friends from you know all the companies that they worked at right so that's not something that's repeatable so those those first one or two aes they actually need to have a very unique profile where they're willing to kind of experiment go out into the market you know try things out and really help to build the playbook themselves because you know that profile of ae is going to be very different from the 100th ae that you hire the 100th ae you hire is someone that's coming in into a machine that's already working and it's taking a playbook that's been you know battle tested and and running that playbook. So the first few AEs also have certain characteristics that are quite close you know to what it's like to being you know a founder as well. Certainly. Now there's a lot of also crowd in the terminology, right? Like there's ABM, there's PLG, there's community. It seems like every year there's like a buzzword, right? There was growth hacking, and there was growth marketing, ABM, PLG, community-led growth, all kinds of things. Tell us about the top B2B GTM trends to watch and what is sort of legit and, and what is buzzwords and noise? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, at Sapphire, we spend a lot of our time investing in go-to-market technology. We've been investing in this category for you know, the better part of the last decade. Um, you know, in the past year, we invested in companies like Qualified, which is a conversational sales and marketing tool. We invested in Captured IQ, which is a commissions management tool. We invested in Involve AI, which is a customer success, um, you know, product, Six Sense, which is an account-based marketing company. So, you know, we've really seen so many good market companies and we're constantly in the market um, speaking with founders as well as speaking with, you know, revenue leaders to understand some of the top trends that, you know, are taking place in the market today. And, um, you know, there's several of them and I'll, I'll basically highlight them from, you know, from the order of like most adoption to, you know, still emerging. You know, I, I think that the top trend that we're seeing in go to market today is account-based marketing. Um, and, you know, it, for each of these trends, it, it takes a little bit of time for these things to mature, right? Account-based marketing, it's been around probably for the past five plus years, uh, but it really only started to like take off, see a lot of adoption in the industry in you know, 2019, 2020, 2021, you start to see all of these account-based marketing vendors um, really accelerate their businesses. And you know, for those that aren't familiar, the premise of account-based marketing or ABM is that you can use data you know, available online, right? All of your potential leads, they're all researching your product online, looking at review sites, um, and you can essentially get that data by working with some of these account-based marketing vendors or working with uh, data vendors. And once you understand you know, that data and what and where a particular lead is in the buyer journey, you can then personalize your engagement with that um, particular account. So usually you're using ABM on a subset of your overall accounts because every company will have a sense for their ideal customer profile and, 
you know, they'll be able to generate a list of 100, 200 accounts that they really want to focus their ABM efforts on and, you know, invest in getting this data on those particular set of accounts and personalize, personalizing the engagement with those accounts as well. So account-based marketing, I think, is, is the top trend that we saw last year from an adoption and maturity standpoint. But, you know, product-led growth is definitely a very close, you know, second to that because product-led growth is something that everyone in the B2B go-to-market world, you know, was talking about and is still talking about today. It's a little bit early in its maturity relative to account-based marketing because in product-led growth, we're still figuring out the playbooks. We're still figuring out the tech stack that you need in order to power a PLG motion. But it's definitely, you know, top of mind. It's definitely seeing a lot of adoption in the industry today. Um, you know, PLG, for those that aren't familiar, it's a go-to-market strategy where the product is central to driving customer acquisition, activation, retention, and expansion. And it's different from your, from your traditional go-to-market motions in the sense that um, your leads get to use the product themselves a lot earlier in the sales process than in the other go-to-market motions. So traditionally, you're selling the customer and then they get to use the products, right? But then in product-led growth, the customer learns about you and then they jump into the product, you know, almost immediately and start to actually get a feel for the product themselves. So product-led growth definitely up there with account-based marketing. Um, you know, the third big trend that we're seeing is just this idea of providing customer data to your go-to-market teams, right? Because customer data has been around for a long time, you know, product data has similarly been around for a long time, but it, it was typically just siloed in the product team, right? The product team and the engineering team, they had this product analytics tools and they're able to use that product data to optimize you know, the, the product itself. But then go-to-market seems to strike a black easy access to this product. And then you know, what changed was that you had the emergence of the data warehouse and now you're able to dump all that data on, from the product, from your customers into the warehouse. And that led to the emergence of these reverse ETL tools. And basically, you know, to simplify what these tools do, they, it's the process by which you take information out of the data warehouse and then you know, provide it to go-to-market teams in the applications that they use currently. So for example, if you take your sales team, your sales team is in your CRM day in, day out. You know, there's this product data, right? That's in your data warehouse. And if you get a reverse ETL tool like High Touch, for example, you can actually sync that data and provide you know, an iframe in your CRM that your, that your sales team can use to contextualize how they engage with their you know, customers. So for example, in the CRM, you might be able to provide a frame that includes just product usage data so that a, sales, a salesperson doesn't have to go to a different you know, interface to see what's going on in the product. They can see that, oh, this customer is increasing, they're spiking their usage or they're exceeding the number of seats that they have signed up for. And so you can actually engage with them and start a conversation around expanding that account. I would say the fourth uh, big trend that we're seeing is also, um, it's related to a company we invested in last year called Qualified. And it's really this idea of how you can accelerate your pipeline by connecting your website to your CRM. And you know, we think of the website as your digital front door. When someone wants to learn about your company, they're gonna to come to your website, they're gonna click around and try to learn about what you do, figure out how much you, your product costs and all that stuff. Um, but you know, what, if, what if you could actually have a panel right, for your salespeople, for your SDRs to visualize who is on your website at a particular point in time and also provide just additional information to the SDR or to the salesperson on that particular visitor. So for example, you know, with Qualified, you, don't only, you can not only identify who's on the website, but you can also figure out you know, what prior outreach sequences has this person been a part of, um, you know, what marketing automation sequence have they been a part of, what events have they attended. Um, you can use your account-based marketing tools to um, show some intent data on where this particular prospect is in the buyer journey. And with all that context, what you're trying to do is just create, you know, segments, right? You're trying to figure out, okay, this is a, a very high value prospect that's, you know, very engaged. And so when they're on my website, I want to make sure that I actually have a salesperson who's alerted to make sure that they're, they're personalizing how we engage with that particular prospect. So for example, if, you know, a, a decision maker from a large tech company that you're selling into is on your website, you, you want to have your salesperson actually start to chat with them see what they need and, and you know, provide value to them in that moment, which is very personalized and it's very unique right, for your prospects to have that kind of experience. But you know, if it's maybe a, an SMB company um, that's maybe not exactly a perfect fit for your business, you might provide them with more information through an automated chatbot you know, on your website. So the whole idea is that by connecting the website to our CRM and to all the other data that we have in our business, we can start to accelerate our pipeline and really um, you know, 
with a bigger top of funnel, we can also hit our numbers on the bottom of the funnel as well. Um, you know, a lot of the things I've talked about so far, they're they're focused on pipeline generation, they're focused on increasing sales productivity. Um, one thing that we also saw in the past year was that there's a lot of new technology now for your go-to-market operations teams. Um, you know, more tools are emerging to replace the spreadsheets that these operations teams typically will work out of. So for example, you know, we recently partnered with a company called Captivate IQ, and they tackle sales commissions management, which a lot of companies, even the largest companies, still manage this process in Excel, which is very tedious, it's very error prone, but you know, we're excited to see companies like Captured IQ emerge to make that process you know, much more streamlined and, and you know, ensure that it's done properly as well. You know, the next trend I'll highlight is just in post sales. Um, you know, your go-to-market motion, there is life after sales. There, you know, the, the customer you know, needs to be, you need to ensure the success of the customer, you need to ensure they implement it properly, you need to ensure that they're retained and, and also expanded. And so we're seeing you know, more and more tools emerge to also help companies with the post-sales journey of the customer. Um, you know, for example, we invested in a company called Involve AI, and they really emerged here to help customer success teams predict customer health. And they also will work with your other customer success tools by being more data-driven, providing more visibility into all of your customer data to ensure that you know, customer su success teams are not reactive, but rather they can be proactive in you know, saving a customer who is showing maybe declining usage or um, helping a customer, upselling a customer who's showing very strong usage and you know, needs a little bit of help, right, to keep moving along and keep being successful. Um, we're also seeing a, a surge in CRM productivity tools. Um, you know, the, the legacy CRMs have probably been around for, you know, 20 years at this point. And, you know, they can be slow to use. They can be, it can take a lot of clicks, right, to get around the CRM and complete your tasks. And what we hear from sales is that it, they hate it, right? They hate having to keep the CRM up to date because it slows them down. It takes away from their time that if you're using to sell new accounts. And so in, you know, 2019, 2021, you know, what we saw was there was just this explosion of um, CRM productivity tools like Scratchpad, like Dooley, uh, like Rattle. And these tools are basically developing, you know, fast, sleek interfaces for your um, sales team to complete their note-taking, complete their task management, complete their pipeline management, and they'll sync all of this information back to the CRM. So now, the salesperson doesn't need to be in the CRM every single day anymore. They can actually work, you know, out of a scratch product or Dooley or Rattle, and all the information they put into these tools gets synced into the CRM. So everyone's happy. The salesperson is happy because they can do their work much faster now, and your sales leadership is happy because the CRM is also up to date. And the next trend we're seeing is just um, this is definitely a newer trend. I think it's one that's definitely catching on. But you know, we're seeing people use AI to generate content um, in the go-to-market world now, and you know, I don't know if you remember, but basically in 2020, we had this, the, there was this thing called the GPT-3 API that, you know, came out one weekend in 2020. And then everybody on Twitter was talking about how you could actually use AI to, uh, to generate like blogs or, you know, text and all that stuff. And of course, some companies have taken this technology, they've adapted it to the go-to-market world, and they're actually starting to use AI to generate marketing copy, uh, social media copy, blog posts, and so on. So there's companies like Jasper AI, Pepper Type, Copy AI, and others that are doing that. And um, you know, since we wrote this blog post in, in May, you know, in the last few months, we've actually started to see companies use AI to generate video content, right? So that's that's where, you know, that's that's the cutting edge now is actually, you know, automatically generating videos um, that go to market teams can use to help their customers, you know, learn how to use the product or um, use those videos to engage customers while they're still in the middle of the sales process. Um, and then the final piece, which I think is, you know, still an emerging area, of course, in 2020, we all saw how events, you know, went online, you couldn't meet in person. So you had these kind of large virtual events. And that was definitely a fantastic solution for event marketing teams who needed to, um, who needed to still engage their customer base, right, and, and provide value to them. Um, but, you know, what we're excited about to see in this particular space is there's a lot of data that's actually collected when you run a virtual event, right? Like, you can, you can track who signed up, you can track who attended, you can track how much time they spent you know, at the event, you can track which sessions they attended, you can track you know, what polls they answered or participated in. There's just so much rich data that's collected by these virtual event tools, but you know, that data is not yet being made available to go-to-market teams to orchestrate the next best action to take with that prospect. And so you know, one thing that we're looking to see in this event marketing category is actually how that data from the virtual events can be better integrated with the rest of the activities that the go-to-market team is taking so that um, 
so that the good marketing can then you know take the right follow-ups, whether it's providing more information to someone that attended the event, whether it's um, you know uh, maybe scheduling a demo for someone who, who seemed to have that interest, or really just informing what the next best thing to do would be uh, for a particular account or particular prospect that attended a, an event. So I'd say those are probably the top trends that you know we're seeing right now in the go-to-market world. And I'm sure you know even the past two months, there's some new things that we popped up that we'll probably add in the next um, iteration of this blog post. Certainly, that is fantastic rundown there. Awesome. So, you know, I want to get into this whole old GTM stack versus modern, right? It seems like, you know, and I'm not seems like, but a lot of people just copy tools that what others use. Oh, you're using this, I'm going to use this. But I think it starts with understanding your buyer journey, understanding your buyer, and then creating a process that builds relationships with them so they buy from you and then layering on technology right and i think the old school did a lot of that and now there's a lot more talk on technology versus process so unpack that for us a little bit old gtm stack versus modern what's the difference yeah it's a great question and you know we titled this blog post demystifying the modern go-to-market tech stack and you know the reason we did that was because we would have conversations with Fortune 500 CIOs, we'd have conversations with startup revenue leaders, you know, everyone complained about how there's just so many technology tools, um, you know, today that they can adopt, right, for their businesses, but they didn't know which tools to pick or to go after. Um, you know, I would say the difference that we see in the modern uh, go-to-market tech stack versus the legacy, legacy tech stack, um, it really just comes down to, you know, new tools and technologies that are available today that you just didn't have previously and you know new models of going to market that are increasingly popular versus you know previously so for example you know the three main go to market motions are inbound outbound and product led actually all three of these have existed in some way for the last you know 20 years right atlassian was founded in 2002 and they're one of like the initial product led growth companies so you know what's different in 2002 versus 2022 if you were to compare your your go to market tech stacks is that You've got you've got some new tools or technologies that were just not available back then um, that you now have available. I, I can use the example of PLG again. You know, we have a company, Monday.com, uh, that is a PLG company founded 10 years ago. And you know, we've we spoke to them severally, and there just wasn't a PLG tech stack right back then. There just wasn't tools that you could buy off the shelf to power your uh, PLG motion. And so what you did was you built everything internally, you hacked it together, you used Google Sheets, you used your BI tool, you had a data analyst was helping you figuring out you know, which um, leads to go after. Uh, but if you're a seed stage company that's adopting a PLG motion today, you know, there's almost no shortage of tools and resources out there to help you, um, you know, with your PLG motion. So you might decide to you know, put a product tour on your website so that a visitor to your website can actually come to the website. Maybe they're not ready to sign up yet for the product, but they can actually click through you know, a basic demo of the product to get a feel for it. Or you know, if you're at a point where you have a large number of visitors to your website and you want people to actually sign up for the product, um, you can maybe use one of the product-led sales tools, right, to orchestrate that as well. So one of the big differences is certainly just there's companies that were started two, three, four years ago that um, were just not available if you were to do this exercise, you know, um, you know, five years ago, ten years ago. So that's one. And I think the second difference is just the popularity of a go-to-market, you know, motion as well as change, like. Inbound and outbound and product light, like I said, they've been around for a long time, but you know, product light is really, it's really only started to become much more popular probably in the last five years. And I think in the last one or two years, that's really hit a crescendo where every company, you know, regardless of how they started their business, is trying to have some type of you know, product led motion um, to their to their business because they see the advantages that you can get out of that. And so, you know, PLG is now becoming much more well defined. Um, you know, playbooks are starting to be developed. There's still a long way to go, of course, in popularizing PLG, but the adoption has certainly been on the upswing. And so that's created demand for a dedicated tech stack to power this new motion. So I think, you know, if we were to have done this blog post five years ago, we probably would not have had a PLG section because one, maybe there's just no tech tools really to highlight there. And two, um, you know, it maybe just wasn't as popular, frankly, back then. But then today it's just imperative and so top of mind. And so it becomes something that we need to actually highlight and talk about. And, you know, show what we're seeing in terms of the tech stack that people are creating in PLG, as well as highlight some of the new tools, right, that people are using in their inbound motions 
and use it in their outbound motions as well. You, you know, with all these tools right now in the market, and I touched on this a little bit in terms of people rush to tools to see what others are using in the space and then just copy that. The personalization has gone out of the window. The buyer journey has gone out of the window, right? Like typically when I join a website and I, I mm -hmm. check out several websites and it's like, you're dismissing a cookie banner. You have to close a chat bot. There's a subscription pop-up. There's something promoting something else. Um, what you're looking for is so hard to find. And then you reload the site maybe, and then you just bounce, right? Like you just leave. Like, I don't know how many times you've gone to a website and experienced this, but that's been my experience is like most tech sites, I'm killing a, a, killing a sort yeah. of a cookie banner. I am, uh, there's like a chat bot right in my face. There's like, I'm, I'm hit with stop signs before I engage with the website. And I don't know why companies do this. They've like tool overload without mm. personalization overload. And I think, uh, you know, it is core to understand your ideal customer profile, the pains they're facing, mapping their buyer journey from awareness all the way to a raving fan, basically yeah. visibility, credibility, then profitability, but awareness to becoming a raving fan and then serving them content and using the right technology to enable the serving of that content and, and gathering the data. But you know, if you keep getting bombed, uh, more and more people are going to get uh, turned off. So this is, this is good insight here from you. Now let's uh, break it down, right? This GTM stack, right? There's hmm. three key categories here. You wanna generate, create awareness and generate some pipeline. Yeah. You, wanna, you wanna close the deal and you wanna handle the operations to make it more and more efficient. So let's dive into that for a second, which you, which you talked about at a high level. What are the key or favorite tools you have at pipeline generation, at deal execution, and then GTM management and operations? Yeah, I'll definitely, you know, we, we have a whole post on this with just several, uh, you know, too many categories to really go through, but you know, I'll try to just give like some of the quick, you know, high level here. Um, so what, like you mentioned, we, we split up the, you know, kind of like the process into pipeline generation, deal execution, and your go-to-market management and operations. And I'll say, you know, for pipeline generation, this really is the journey from being a cold lead to a warm prospect. And, you know, there are, there are three distinct flavors of engagement here, which can be inbound, which can be outbound, and your product-led growth. Um, these approaches, they look a little bit siloed in our tech stack, but in practice, you know, the journey of your prospect is typically going to traverse from, you know, one to the next. So for example, you might have someone who comes to your website inbound, but then, you know, perhaps it's not the right time. They don't really engage uh, with your company. And then at a later point in time, they realize they actually have a need for what you sell and they, they just, you know, put in your URL into their website and they come organically to your site and they, you know, sign up for your product and start using it. So, you know, that customer, that prospect may go from being inbound to PLG. And then similarly, you know, a, a prospect may have gotten an outbound email from your, from your SDR team and didn't engage because again, that wasn't the right time. They're inundated with emails, but then, you know, maybe they heard about your business on a podcast and then they come in inbound um, to you. So we have, the, we have, we showed kind of inbound, outbound and product like growth, but then, you know, really a, a prospect can traverse these three different approaches and ultimately, um, you know, convert into a lead that your sales team wants to, uh, you know, go after. Um, so, you know, and when it comes to inbound, you know, my favorite tools in there are probably going to be, you know, in the account-based marketing world, like I mentioned, which we, I mentioned earlier in the trends, um, you know, where investors in six cents in that particular category, and then as well as in the conversational sales and marketing world too, because, you know, when someone comes inbound to your website, it's great if you can actually engage with them um, through the chat interface. It's great if you, if it's a very high value prospect, you can use qualified to actually have a salesperson have a conversation with that with that prospect as they're on the website, you know, at that point in time. So I'd probably highlight account-based marketing and conversational sales and marketing as my top uh, inbound tools. When it goes to outbound, I think in outbound, it's really all about the sales engagement tools uh, like, like Outreach, uh, which is one of our portfolio companies, and also maybe your sales enablement tools like Highspot, because you need to start, um, need your sales team to be, to be having the same message, right, when they speak to prospects. And then in product-like growth, um, 
you know, the data warehouse is a very established category there, but now I'll talk about product analytics, right? Because you need to have your product instrumented with analytics tools like Pendo, one of our portfolio companies is really one of the big players in that space. And then the emerging category of product led sales um, tools. And these are, you know, these are basically products that will ingest data from your warehouse, from your, from your product analytics tools, from your CRM, from your billing tools, and help you figure out which of the thousand, you know, free accounts you should actually go after and have your sales team start to put more you know, effort into uh, farming and turning that into a big account. So, so that's pipeline generation, you know, taking a cold lead and turning that into one prospect for your sales team to then execute on. So that transitions to deal execution. You've got all these leads generated by inbound, outbound, PLG. Ultimately, those leads have to be fed to sales and then sales will qualify those leads and will accept you know, some of them and then now it's on the sales team to close, you know, that particular opportunity. So deal execution just it, it it's encompasses the various tools that your sales reps, as well as other members of your of your go-to-market team, because closing the deal is not just about sales, it's also about your sales engineering team, right? Or your pre-sales team. It's also about your, you know, your your finance team, your operations team, um, as well as your you know, customer success, account management, implementation, all these teams are coming together to you know, help close the deal and also ensure that the customer is successful, you know, once they've signed up for your product as well. So, you know, in, in this particular category, like in sales, for sales and sales engineering meetings, I think it's, it's really great to have, again, some of your sales and implement tools in there, like your high spot, which would be good for managing the content that you need to discuss with your sales teams. Um, it's great to also have conversational sales and conversational intelligence tools. Uh, like Gong and Chorus, because your salespeople are on meetings every single day. They're getting a lot of insights on the market. And it's fantastic if you can have those um, calls recorded and then they can be shared with other people on the um, go-to-market team, on the product team, on the marketing team, so that they can also um, fine-tune the activities based on the information they're learning. And I think in, you know, when it comes to generating your proposals, negotiating and closing the deals, um, you, know, you need to have a great configure price quote tool in there, like a CPQ tool. Um, in there in order to ensure that your sales team is efficiently putting together a proposal and um, getting that signed off from uh, the leadership. And then in post sales, of course, you need to have a, a customer success tool, which is so critical in order to ensure that you're staying on top of your accounts, you're seeing which ones are, um, you're seeing which ones are being successful, you're seeing which ones maybe are declining in usage, and you can intercept that and you know, help to correct the situation. And then finally, you know, you need to have a layer of go to market management and operations. Uh, in place to ensure that your pipeline generation is working as expected. And if you, you know, you can, you can forecast and see maybe when things might start to drop off, uh, for example, and you can take the right action before time. Um, you need to have, you know, the management team, right, that's ensuring that you have the right people in place, um, you know, you're going to get your forecast, and so on and so forth. So, you know, in this section, we talk about various tools that help with like pipeline management and forecasting. So there's there's tools like Clary, which we're also an investor in, and they really help companies to just understand, right? Like just based on all of their pipeline generation activities, based on all of their meetings and how conversion is taking place, how likely are they to hit a certain forecast and therefore what corrective actions they need to take um, if they're not you know, on track. Um, of course, you need to plan your go-to-market and compensation um, as well, because you know, when you have a big sales team, you need to actually start defining territories, right? And then you need to make sure that you have appropriate staff in each territory. Um, as well. And then you need to manage how you compensate your sales teams because sales teams are paid not just on salary, but also on commissions. And it can actually get very, very complicated um, how to calculate commissions based on, you know, based on all the different levers that, uh, you know, management is using to incentivize the sales team. And, you know, finally, we also highlighted uh, community management uh, tools here because, you know, to your, to your point um, earlier, Lloyd, communi communities are becoming such a bigger part of um, everything in B2B SaaS. We've had several companies like Pando acquired a community uh, earlier, Outreach acquired another community earlier. Um, and, you know, some of the product like companies, they're also building up communities as well to kind of build this, um, to build this audience right around what they're doing. So I think, you know, it's important to have these tools that can help you manage that community, ensure that you're maximizing uh, the engagement of that community and ensuring that people are able to, you know, find the help that they need to adopt you know, your tools and also find the help they need to even build the teams, right, that would be um, would be using those tools as well. So, so that's what we're seeing, you know, from a from just the perspective of those different categories and you know, some of the top tools, I would say, in there as well. 
I'm a big believer in community. You know, yesterday's yeah. innovation always becomes today's option and tomorrow's commodity. Look at the GPS. You couldn't get your hands on it. Then it became an option in cars and now there's CarPlay, right? So you don't exactly. even need it. But if you build a community, you won't become a commodity, right? You're not selling products, you're selling an experience, you're providing an experience, you're building connection and that connection will help everything from customer success to product feedback to innovating faster. And we've seen it with companies like HubSpot. At IPO, they were yeah. a billion market cap and at peak before the pan at the heart of the pandemic, they were at 40 billion. Or you look at um, companies like Gainsight that you know there were no categories and right. they provided value and built a community around the practice and elevated the profession and then they became the tool yeah. of choice so i mean you're a big traction. believer in that traction is a great community as well right like people come here to learn all about the best practices in, in the startup world i think saster is another amazing community as well you and i met at saster you know last year right and you could just feel the energy um around everything b2b SaaS. so it, it really is a a big component right of how you can differentiate um your company today yeah definitely definitely awesome now i want to dive into a few more things here, right? Like um, one, actually, there's a lot of tools, right? I don't know if you can talk to perhaps what is the cost per GTM head when it comes to all this cool tools combined? Is there like a benchmark people should aspire towards? And then let's say at the product market fit stage, series A versus series B, is there you see a different set of tools or people add more more uh, tools as they grow. Like, what are you seeing out there? Because if you're a seed stage company, like all the list of tools from pipeline generation to deal execution, the GTM management and operation, from a per head GTM yeah. head perspective, it could be thousands of dollars, right? It could just eat right into your gross margin, yeah, of which although it's not- point. Yeah, and I, I think you know in the early days you you want to you want to move as quickly as possible and be more flexible. Whereas as you mature, then you actually need more tools to enable your employees to be more productive. You know, I haven't come across like a definitive um, technology as a percentage of uh, maybe payroll, but you know, one I did see a stat recently that like maybe technology tends to be about twelve percent of you know how much you spend on payroll. So I wouldn't say that's a benchmark, but that is that is maybe one quick data point that I did I came across recently. Um, and I think certainly, you know, I had a conversation with several founders and with several investors to figure out, you know, what are the absolutely essential tools in the early stages? And then, you know, what are the things that you can start to adopt as you hit the growth stages? And I would say, you know, early stage, I'm, I'm basically defining, defining this as like seed series A, series B. And, you know, what, you know, in the, in the very earliest days, like as a, I think as a seed company, um, you know, you still want to have something like a CRM, right? So you, you're still going to have maybe a HubSpot might be the first CRM that you adopt, or you might just manage your, your deals out of like an Airtable or one of the other kind of entry-level CRMs. And then you eventually you upgrade to something like Salesforce, right? Even at the Series A or, or the Series B. So this is something you'll see commonly is like you might, you'll start with like a, a basic or entry-level version um, of the category, and then you upgrade to like the industry standard version. Um, you know, once you hit Series A, B, you have a bit more money, you have a bit more, um, you know, prospects that you need to manage. So CRMs are definitely a must-have from day one. And then you might start with the with the HubSpot, and then upgrade to like Salesforce once you hit the Series A or B. Um, then there's contact data. That's something that's also essential, right? It, it, no matter how early stage the company is, and you might start with something like Elite IQ, or you might start with the Lucia in your pre-seed or seed days, and then you could upgrade to something like Zoom Info at Series A or B when you have more, um, you have more capital and you want to have you know, multiple of these tools anyways to ensure that you have good coverage. Um, I think it's essential to also have sales engagement tools, um, probably more at Series A, B than at Seed, Pre-Seed, because at Series A, B, you, you're, you are starting to have more leads, you have certain revenue targets, um, and you're trying, to, you know, you're trying to have all of your different leads in a cadence so that you can ultimately land those meetings with them. Um, conversational intelligence is another key category. I think that's probably like a day one category, kind of like your CRM, because even in the early days, your founder or your early, you know, your early sales leader is having conversations with potential, you know, prospects, with customers. There's lots of learnings uh, that can be garnered from those calls. And, you know, those are things that you probably want to share with other people on the team as well, so that they can, you know, be in tune with the customer as well. So I would, I'd say conversational intelligence is probably like a day one tool alongside your CRM and contact data. 
Um, and then if you're a PLG company, you know, you might, you, you might want to adopt a product analytics tool, you know, early on in your journey so that you can actually get access to all that data on what, on what your customers are doing in the product. And then you can use that to hack together, maybe a PQL um, or other ways of identifying which customers to focus on, you know, with your sales efforts and convert to um, paying customers or convert to bigger accounts. Um, when you get to the growth stage, like Series C and beyond, then I think, you know, you have a lot more resources at your disposal. You've got a bigger team. You know, you need to generate a lot more pipeline uh, for that go-to-market team, for that sales team to convert. And so I'd say at Series C and beyond, this is where it starts to make sense to, you know, have a dedicated account-based marketing tool, you know, like a Sixth Sense. You know, this is where you should certainly have a conversational sales and marketing tool like a qualified so that you can do a better job of converting those leads that come to your website. Um, you want to have a sales enablement tool like Highspot because now you've got, you know, a decently sized sales team. You want to make sure that they're all using the same, you know, assets to, to, to share with customers and have those initial meetings with customers. Um, you certainly want to have a sales compensation management tool because now you've got like 20 reps or more and it's too hard to kind of do all the commissions calculations instead of Excel at that point. Um, and then, you know, you also have, you know, probably multiple levels of sales leadership. You have your sales people, you have your sales managers or directors, and maybe a, a VP of sales. So you want to start getting more academic about your pipeline management and forecasting to ensure that you hit the goals that the company has set, you know, to investors and to the business itself. And then finally, I think at this stage, if you're a PLG company, then you might want to adopt one of the, you might want to start evaluating some of the product-led sales tools. These are still quite early stage, right? Companies like Focus and Heads Up and Calixa, correlated end game and so on. They're still quite early stage themselves, but then, you know, this might be the point where you want to experiment with those tools because now you probably have thousands or tens of tens of thousands of free users in your, your, your free product. Again, this is for PLG companies. And uh, you, you want to make sure that your sales team is efficient in picking the right ones to focus on and, you know, convert to accounts and then ultimately, you know, expand those relationships uh, too. So, so you can get by with some basic, you know, CRM contact data, conversational intelligence, sales engagement, PLG, when you're an early stage company, seed series A, series B. And then when you get to growth stage, like series C and beyond, I think you definitely want to add on ABM, uh, conversational sales and marketing, sales enablement, sales compensation management, as your skill, as your sales team starts to scale and you need, you actually need tools in order to uh, be productive and be efficient at that point. Definitely, definitely. So now we're in this, crazy market downturn, right? We'd love to get your thoughts as we close out the conversation here. We went from one and a half unicorns being minted every day and sky high valuations to a ton of uncertainty. Interest rates are up, SaaS stocks are taking a beating, valuations are down. Every other company is laying off every other day. What's happening in venture capital right now? What is driving investment decision-making? Yeah, it's... You know, it's a it's a market that just it feels like it changes week by week. You know, and um, you know, my context is that look, twenty twenty one was was a record year in venture capital. Um, it was perhaps the height of exuberance that I've been building for several years. Right, we had, we had been in this very long bull market, and as you mentioned, twenty twenty two, there's been rising interest rates, there's been a declining stock market, and that has impacted venture capital. It's it's caused a you know a significant slowdown in venture capital. Um, I saw some data from Pitchbrook recently on the Q2 U.S. venture capital market, and you know they found that total deal, deal count was down 25% from Q1 to Q2, and similarly, dollars deployed was also down 25% from Q1 to Q2. You know what I would say anecdotally, just as a growth investor in my day-to-day -day experience in the market, is that the picture is probably a little bit worse because I, you know, when it comes to dollars deployed and even deals completed, because you have fewer mega rounds taking place today. A lot of growth stage companies, you know, wisely raised capital in 2021. And so they can actually manage that capital for, you know, a slightly longer period, right, than maybe they initially planned. So my, my guess is that growth stage deals are probably down more than 25% and growth stage dollars deployed similarly, probably down more than 25%. But look, I think things are changing quickly, right? If we had had this conversation two to three weeks ago, I would have said that the slowdown is probably going to continue for multiple quarters. I've been a lot more pessimistic two to three weeks ago. Um, but over the last one to two weeks, I've definitely seen growth stage fundraising activity pick up. Um, I'm seeing more companies, more founders come to market. And so I'm expecting that there'll be an uptick in activity over the coming weeks. And you know, that'll probably snowball into a spike in deal activity 
in Q4 as everyone looks to close out the year on a strong note. So it feels like we're probably maybe past the worst of it in the private markets because you know we've seen the impacts over the last six to seven months. And then I, it feels like things are trying to pick up a little bit more and I would probably expect, you know, a spike in Q4 as we head to the end of the year. What is a stable valuation? Because I've seen as crazy as 40X, 100X, and who knows what X, right? It was a demand and supply. And I think there was an oversupply of dry powder and capital in the market, but wasn't as much supply of good startups. So these valuations went up like crazy. Um, what are you seeing as reasonable metrics to valuations at seed, series A, series B? Or what do you think it should be? Yeah, you know, it's it's a great question. And I, I, I spent some time looking for some data on this because it's best to be data driven on this, right? So, and interestingly, AngelList actually has a resource um, called real-time startup valuation data. So for you know, for founders, we're looking for, you know, a, a week-to-week or month-to-month data on what's going on in valuations and round size and all that stuff, they can just check out AngelList's um, real-time startup valuation data. And, you know, you know what, I, what I'm seeing here, like when it comes to pre-seed and seed deals based on this data, it shows, you know, a median of maybe 10 million post money at pre-seed and 20 million, you know, at seed stage. But, you know, anecdotally, I would say that is, that is just a median. That is a statistical <laughs> uh, calculation. There's definitely a lot of uh, pre-seed and seed deals that get done at, you know, below those levels. And sometimes you see like outlier deals that get done above those levels because it could be in like a very hot category like Web3 or crypto, or it could be, you know, a second time founder or a third time founder, you know, coming to a market with, with a new idea. And so you might have some of these outlier deals that pull up the medians um, as well. You know, at, at Series A, I think you, at Series A, the, the, the median is a bit, the range, there's a bit more of a range to the median at Series A, right? Like, in, in precedent, it seems pretty tight around 10 and 20 million respectively, but at Series A, you know, again, probably with some maybe outlier deals taking place on a week to week, a month to month basis, you know, the median valuation for a Series A this year has been between 50 million to 100 million, which also kind of, you know, makes sense anecdotally uh, to me as well. And again, that spread is just going to depend on the metrics of the business, the category the business is in, uh, the, the founder's background and things of that nature. And then, you know, similarly at Series B, the, the median ranges from 150 million to 300 million based on the AngelList data uh, that I saw earlier, which again, you know, again, that anecdotally, that also makes sense to me. But similarly, some deals are going to get done above that level because this business is like a once in a lifetime business. And so, um, you know, investors will still bid heavily on that. Or again, maybe it's a business in, in a slower category or a business that's growing more slowly. And so they might end up at the lower end of that, of that range. So Interestingly, I, I would say there's been some, it, it feels like the valuations have stayed relatively, like you haven't seen a big drop in valuations relative to last year. Um, I think there's still a gap between where founders want their companies to be valued and where investors think the businesses should be valued. So perhaps over the coming quarters, you know, that gap might close and you might see like a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a reversion to the mean, right, with valuations. But for now, it feels like valuations have stayed relatively steady, but then, you know, deals are down and, um, Deal, dollars invested are down because people can't people can't meet the expectations that founders have uh, right now. Definitely. And then uh, you're an investor. You're a number of boards. What metrics boards and investors are focusing on right now? Like, what are the leading indicators of good, bad, and ugly? How worse does it get? What are you advising in portfolio companies? Yeah, this is something we spent a lot of time earlier this year focused on because. You know, we could see the writing on the wall. We could, we could, we could tell that there was going to be a big slowdown um, in investing. And then, of course, you had all of those black swan memos come out, and and you know they they basically forecasted a doomsday scenario. Um, you know, for 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 us, we focus on B two B SaaS companies typically at growth stage, and so you know it's still important to actually grow in this market, right? I think that's probably the big challenge for many companies that you still need to actually show you know good growth despite the pullback in the markets. And so we're monitoring ARR growth to make sure that that doesn't decline to, you know, to like poor levels. Um, secondly, we also spend a lot of time evaluating some of the, you know, margins, right, of the business. So gross profit margin, for example, looking at how the business, how efficient the business is in managing its cost of goods sold. Um, but probably the biggest focuses are on efficiency, right? Like a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of the sales and marketing teams, you know, got heavy investments in the past few years as, there was just such a focus on growth at all costs, but 
you know, in an, in an environment like this, it's very, very important for companies to extend their runway as much as possible. Sales and marketing tends to be the largest operating expense on the PL for most companies. And so sales efficiency is one that we're tracking, you know, very, very closely to make sure that companies can reduce, you know, the burn in that particular category, but be efficient with those dollars and still grow at decent rates. Um, I think retention is another big one that we're watching in this market because, you know, every company is looking for ways to cut back on spend, right? They might, they might reduce their, and some of them will look at reducing their software spend as a result. So we want to make sure that our companies are maintaining very strong retention levels despite the poor macroeconomic environment. Um, and, you know, one exercise we did with a lot of our companies earlier this year was just helping them to benchmark their operating expenses, right? At a time when you need to extend your run rate as much as possible. You're not, there's no sacred cow. Every department, right, is going to be looked at and scrutinized and you're going to try to evaluate where you can cut some of the uh, spend in that particular department. So, you know, we helped a bunch of our portfolio companies with benchmarking their operating expenses like sales, marketing, customer success, GNA, R&D. And essentially we're comparing how, how much they spend in these categories to their revenue. And then we're taking those ratios and comparing those to similar companies um, while those companies are at a similar revenue scale to that business. So for example, if I, if I have a company that's at 10 million AR, I'll calculate these ratios of sales to revenue, marketing to revenue, generate to revenue, and then I'll benchmark that right against, against my prior portfolio companies so that I can understand where, whether this comes on the high end or on the low end or right in the middle, right? So that's something we did for a lot of portfolio companies. And if you're a founder out there, this is something that your investors can definitely you know, help you with. Um, and then, you know, burn and runway, right? It's a capital constraint environment, at least more so than, you know, it was in the prior years. And so it's very, very important for companies to manage their burn. And one of the metrics to look at in burn is just, you know, how much net new AR a company is able to generate for every dollar of their net burn. Um, and then, of course, that feeds into runway, right? So if you're burning X amount, right, with some basic assumptions, how many months of runway do you have, um, you know, with, at that level of burn? And, you know, especially taking account the time that it takes to fundraise in this market as well. So the top things are really around, you know, managing operating expenses, ensuring as much efficiency as possible out of those expenses. And then on the customer end, it's going to be about retention while still, you know, trying to grow at a decent rate. But, you know, there's been a shift from growth at all costs to efficient growth. So while companies still need to grow, they need to make sure that they're doing that efficiently because there's going to be more points given to efficient growth than just growing at all costs. Fantastic. Now, where are you seeing companies double down and where are they pulling back? Yeah, you know, I think I think companies need to look at every single, you know, bucket, honestly, right? Because you you're you're trying to you're trying to cut back as much, you know, fat in the organization as much as possible. So it only makes sense to look at everything from, you know, your customer success to customer support to your sales, marketing. R&D, GNA, and just, you know, cut out as much software spend or fat, right, in those organizations as you can. Um, but, you know, the one key area that I think a lot of companies look at is just that sales and marketing spend. It is, again, it tends to be the largest operating expense on the PNL. And not only that, if you look at the past few years, there's been such an emphasis on growth at all costs. And, you know, that means that a lot of people have hired significantly in those departments. People have spent on you know, all kinds of software tools in those departments. And so, um, you know, sales and marketing is probably one place that there is a larger focus on as a result, just being how big of a bucket it is. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to doubling down, I think it's really, you know, it's really about being more efficient, right? Like, I think this, this correction is actually good for companies because they can look at their organizations and, you know, figure out ways to be much more efficient with fewer resources, meaning that when companies come out of these cycle, this cycle, they're going to be a lot stronger um, going forward. And, you know, when capital is abundant, again, they'll be able to actually take that capital and, you know, generate much more AR and much more value for the company, the employees, as well as for the investors, you know, as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's not maybe one department to double down on as much as it is just trying to be more efficient in every single department, trying to get as much as possible out of each team. And then when you come out of the cycle, you're in a much stronger place, you know, than you were before. So I think that's how, a lot of the best CEOs, a lot of the top CEOs are looking at this cycle as an opportunity, right? To build efficiency into their businesses. Yeah, a lot of people also overhired because they raised more money and they thought the times were good. And you know, you spend maybe 25, 30% of your time experimenting on experimenting on new channels, 
new ideas and probably that experimentation has been cut and it's like double down or focus on what's generating the repeatable stuff. Exactly. Spend energy and effort on the repeatable stuff and maybe let's delay some of the experiments, the longer stuff, uh, the longer time horizon items. Awesome. As you talk to more and more founders, what's one unconventional piece of advice that founders ignore but shouldn't? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And I feel like there's so much startup advice out there. You know, um, I think like the one that is very top of mind for me in this market is is just talent, right? Like I think when you're in the middle of when you're in the middle of of running your company, um, you know, there can be there can be a lot of temptation to just like compromise on on hiring talent because you need to get someone in the door uh, to run that particular team. And so, you know, I think the when you when you think about a software company or, or an internet company. It's literally people and then just, you know, whatever tech stack, whatever technology tools that they have, like that's how they're building these software companies at the end of the day. And, and people are the biggest lever, you know, that you have. And so I think it's really, really important to continue to keep the talent bar high and also develop the talent that you have internally so that, you know, the talent that you invest in actually doesn't just walk out the door, you know, the moment that um, they found success in the industry. So so that's probably the biggest thing that I, 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 that I think companies can continue to focus on because talent is just, that's the biggest lever that you have in, you know, in a software company and the best people, you know, tend to be many, that tend, the best way to multiply, right, in your organization as well, because they, they attract other, you know, very strong players who kind of, you know, attract the next set of strong players and really help the business to uh, succeed. So, so I think talent is just a continued area of focus, um, you know, for all founders, you know, today. Fantastic. And any books you recommend? What are you reading? What's on your shelf or things that you've loved over your journey? Yeah, no, I think this is a this is a great question because this year I think I've listened to probably a dozen or so audiobooks this year. Um, and I, that was one of my big things coming into the year was actually to listen to more books or at least you know, engage with more content. And a lot of them have been quite great actually, but I'll highlight two um, because I think this is probably a good time to maybe put some of these things into practice. And the first one is The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. And basically in the book, he talks about how little positive actions compounded over time can lead to, you know, a significant, you know, it can help you achieve your goals. And I'm sure we've all seen, you know, people have done the calculations, right? If you improve by like 1% every day, you ultimately double or triple yourself, you know, over time. So it's really just that concept of like taking a little habit, right? And doing it consistently, you know, it helps you ultimately achieve the right goals. So so that's the one that I'll I'll highlight um, first, and then you know we were talking just now about you know where should startups, where should founders um, cut back, and where should they focus on? You know the, the other book I would recommend is the 80-20 principle by Richard Koch, and you know basically everyone is familiar with the 80-20 principle. You know 80, 20 percent of the efforts result in 20 percent of efforts lead to 80 percent of the results. 20 percent of your customers are 80 percent of your revenue. You know, 10 percent of your sales team is 80 percent of your your new AR or your new bookings. You know, it, you see the 80 20 rule in pretty much almost every facet of life. So I think in an in an era where there's just not as much capital and where you need to manage your resources as efficiently as possible, it's important to apply this 80 20 principle, right? And look at you know what are the 20 percent of things that generate the 80 percent of results. I, I like what your example, right? Like there, you might be experimenting with various channels or like various products or various things like that, but you know, when you need to be more efficient, you need to actually look at the 20%, you need to double down the 20% that are working really well. Um, the thing that I will add on to what we all know about the 80-20 principle is that you can actually apply that principle again and again and again, right? It's not just a one-time thing. You know, you apply it to the first time, you get to a subset of your, you know, accounts or a subset of your, of your, of your tactics. And then you can actually apply that principle again, right? Like what 80% or what 20% of this subset is generating the 80% of results, right? In this particular, um, category and you know that can that helps you really distill it down to like what you really need to focus on and all the different things that can be cut from your business or from your spend and so on and so forth so i think i think when the focus is on efficiency thinking about that 80, thinking in terms of the 80 20 principle i think is very very useful um you know for founders and for everyone alike fantastic and you know i like it success is a small group of things done consistently well over time, not like starting, stopping, starting, stopping, right? When you do a small group of actions and you do it consistently well and just do better and better every day, the compound interest is huge and, and that's what it becomes. I mean, when we started Traction, 
we were doing pizza nights and like seven, 10 people were showing up yeah. and today it's like a hundred thousand subscribers. And, and, you know, we just did these webinars regularly, just doing it regularly, like regularly, right. A lot of people sometimes, you know, the first time, second time, fifth time, people don't show up. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, maybe it's the 10th time if you would have done 10 people would have show up, showed up. Right. And it's, it's just as much promotion as it is product, right. You need those things to be in, in, in tandem. Exactly. And, and do it very consistently well over time. Awesome. So where can we follow you? Where are you active? Yeah, I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn. I think I'm on LinkedIn for too many hours of the day. So uh, you, you can find me, follow me at Demi or Biomi on, on LinkedIn. And then also on Twitter um, as well. I'm on Twitter occasionally. So you can find me there at Demi underscore by me as well and i you know really look forward to engaging with the traction community and you know continue to be a part of the community as well and also learn from you know your other guests uh, um, on the podcast too fantastic demi thank you so much what a great pleasure i learned a ton and thank you for unpacking unpacking this whole cluster mess of tools and how to think about it i really like this pipeline generation deal close and then operations, right? And, exactly. and figuring out figuring out basically what's that one repeatable, scalable process that you can have, process and channel to acquire customers, and then enabling the right tooling to streamline that. If you don't have a process, no tool is going to fix exactly. things yeah. for you, right? There's no magic exactly tool. Right. I wish there was. I think this is an idea for a multi-billion dollar startup is like you put your ICP in, you pour some effort in, and outcomes leads. There's nothing like that anymore. Yeah. Everything, yeah. everything you, leads effort. That's that's the hard work of startups, right? Is you have this great idea, but then you need to test it against the market. And and rarely ever is like your really ever your initial ideas all going to be correct, right? So um, you know, it, it reminds me of that Mike Tyson quote, right? That like everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. When you take your product to market, you're gonna get punched in the face, right? Because you made some assumptions that were wrong, or the market has changed, right? Since you since you had the idea. So really focusing on iterating on that go to market playbook and finding you know where what's working what's not is just super super important and no tool is going to help you do that so it really comes down to the people you know at the end of the day exactly i love it everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face so move fast test fast iterate fast shift fast and and change and adapt along the way thank you so much my man thank you for joining us and look forward to hanging out in person in a couple of weeks at tractionconf.io thank you demi yeah thanks a lot lloyd looking forward to it talk soon i need some traction